Good morning, everybody. I feel like we've just had a lot of special Sundays these past few, few weeks and months. You know, you know, I came, there was the vote, um, then Terry, we commissioned him off, then Joe came, and now I'm here again. And this is like, this is kind of a special Sunday in a way. And um, it's good to be here as your pastor. And, uh, you know, one thing before I get in the message, I just wanted to just make known and just put out there and just let anybody out here know, let anybody online know to, that I'm here as your pastor. What you expect of a pastor, I want to be for you. I want to listen. I want to pray with you. I want to help you find your greatest potential in Christ because that's the reason we live. As we'll get in the message here, there's one part where I'll mention that we are God's workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works. That's what we're created for. Um, but before I get into the message, would you just pray with me? Jesus, we don't want to hear from anyone but you. That Jesus, even you said, I do not speak unless the Father gives me something to speak. That the works I do are the works the Father gives me to do. That you, God, were so humble to say that I don't do anything unless the Father tells me. So God, we acknowledge in this room that you brought us together to hear from you, not from me, not from anyone, but God. Father, would you just bring us by your Spirit into a place where our hearts can be transformed, where our minds can be transformed, where our lives can change, because our lives are always going to be changing until we meet you in glory. Lord, open your word to us this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. So when I was younger, um, I was just flipping through the TV one night, and I was flipping channels, and all of a sudden I flipped to this program, and there was these guys fighting I mean, these were big guys, and they were in this ring, but it wasn't like UFC. It wasn't like boxing. It was more staged than that. There were these people with signs. They were cheering. There was lights going, and these guys were fighting. They were big dudes, and I was entertained. I mean, I was, I don't know, I was elementary age. I was entertained. Like, wow, these guys are huge. They're going, I still remember their names. The one guy's name was King Booker T. He wasn't an actual king, but that's what his name was, and Bobby Lashley. These guys were going at it, and I was entertained. I mean, they were jumping off ropes. They were throwing each other. It was crazy. Uh, and so I watched this thing. I went over to my neighbor's house because he was kind of my childhood best friend, and, and I, I showed him what I was watching, and we, we got into this thing. And we got the action figures. We got the video games. And what we were watching was WWE. Does anybody know what that is? It used to be called WWF. <laughs> World Wrestling Entertainment. And... I mean, I was intrigued, and we, we, we committed to this thing, and we really wanted to be wrestlers. We started wrestling ourselves as well. I mean, obviously not actually hitting each other, strangling each other, but we jumped off some couches. It was all right. <sighs> but then one day, I found out something that just flipped it in my mind, that I didn't really like WWE anymore as much as I thought. I found out that WWE is as real as a soap opera. <laughs> it's not real fighting. It's fake, it's staged. These guys, they're actually big, they're actually strong, but they're just, they're faking it. Like, they're not actually trying to hurt each other. It's just all entertainment, world wrestling entertainment. And it just flipped. It flipped something in my mind, and I wasn't as committed as I thought I was. Something happened, and it just changed it for me. Can you remember a time in your life where something happened and it just flipped something in your mind about an area of your life? Where you just didn't look at that, that part of your life the same way, you didn't look at your life the same way. It could be small, it doesn't have to be something huge, world-changing, uh, worldview-shifting moment. But you just never looked at things the same way. It just wasn't, um, it wasn't the same. Today, what is tradi traditionally known as Palm Sunday, there were a lot of there was a lot of people around this, this event, this momentous event that we recognize that Jesus came into Jerusalem. This would be before he was um, eventually crucified. And there were responses to 
this kingship of Jesus, Jesus coming into the city, was announcing his kingship. And there were several responses. And this morning, this was originally supposed to be one message, but I, I sense God was kind of breaking it up into two. And, uh, but over the course of this Sunday and, and Easter next week, I want us to listen to God, because perhaps he's trying to impress on our hearts that sometimes our response to Jesus in faith won't necessarily be a sustainable response. That perhaps there's something in our faith that is going to prevent us from actually living it out, from it sustaining through the disruptions and storms of life. See, perhaps that sometimes when our world, when our lives are periodically shaken, our faith can sometimes reveal its potential to falter, and it will reveal the true integrity of our foundation in Christ. Is our faith sustainable? Will it endure? So turn with me, if you will, to Matthew chapter 21. Matthew chapter 1, the first book in the New Testament. Now Mark and Luke and John, they, they, they eat too, talk about the triumphal entry, but we're going to go with Matthew this morning. So Matthew, Matthew chapter 21, we'll have it on the screen as well. I'm reading out of the ESV, so if you have a concern, drop it in the offering plate. <laughs> Complaints. Put it on the prayer card. <laughs> All right. All right, Matthew chapter 21. Now when they drew near to Jerusalem and came to Bethphage, to the Mount of Olives, then Jesus sent two of his disciples, saying to them, Go into the village in front of you, and immediately you will find a donkey tied and a colt with her. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, just say to them, The Lord needs them, and he will send them at once. This took place to fulfill what was spoken by the prophet saying, Say to the daughter of Zion, Behold, your king is coming to you, humble and mounted on a donkey, on a colt, the full of a beast of burden. The disciples went and did as Jesus directed them. They brought the donkey and the colt and put on them their cloaks, and he sat on them. Most of the crowd spread their cloaks on the road, and, and others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. The crowds that went before him um, and that followed him were shouting, and, and say this with me, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. And when he entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred up, saying, Who is this? And the crowd said, This is the prophet Jesus from Nazareth of Galilee. See, a few observations. This whole situation wasn't just something that happened on a particular day where these people just happened to be here and, and this was, was spur of the moment. This was a prophecy being fulfilled from what the prophet Zacharias spoke in chapter 9 of that book. And you can go back and you can read that for yourself. So this was something that was prophesied to happen that the person who would fulfill the prophecy would be known as the king of Israel. The person who comes into the city riding on a donkey, humbled, was the person that was the king. And if they recognized it or not, if, if the people there were understanding they were part of a prophecy, I don't know. But that's, this is what this is. This was a God-ordained moment. It was a prophecy. And now people know what kings are like. And, and we don't necessarily live in that kind of culture where we understand kings as much as they may have or people who come from that sort of culture. But we know that when we see someone that we deem worthy to be a ruler, someone who stands for what we stand for, someone who believes what we believe in, we are so passionate and quick about pushing that person towards the top. And whether these people here gleam that from the prophecy they recognize or they just knew Jesus was the one they wanted to be king, that's what they were doing. It was like a political campaign almost. They were pushing him. They were praising him. They were shouting him into the city. But Jesus was different. Jesus was different. Next Sunday, we're going to look a little bit closer at what truly made Jesus different from an earthly ruler. But I'll give you this hint. Behold, your king is coming to you. Because just where has Jesus come from and what is Jesus going into 
will reveal what type of king he really is. He's not like the earthly rulers we think of. So Jesus is coming into the city and the people are shouting. The word there for shouting is kratzo. It, it, it doesn't really get at the heart of just yelling really loudly. No, this is like you're at a, a basketball game or a football game and people are shouting. You have no clue what they're shouting about. You can't really un- make what they're shouting at. But you know what they're shouting about, right? And, and by some miracle, Matthew pulls out what they're actually saying. But they are screaming. For the king. They are screaming. And so the people of the city were disrupted by this screaming. They were, they were just like, what is going on? Who is, who is coming into the city? So many people were praising him, the king that they've waited for for so long. I mean, they, they were treating him as a king triumphant in battle, really, lying their cloaks on the ground, cutting down branches. It was going nuts. And they were and the people of the city were disrupted because their worldview was not that Jesus was the savior of the world. It was not that this Jesus guy who these people are talking about is going to be the king. That wasn't on their radar, I don't think. And Joe was here with us last week and he said the same, kind of a similar thing, that there are people in our lives that have no clue that, that Jesus in following him, him as Lord of our lives, that's not something that they think about or is important to them. But it is important. See, these people of the city who are disrupted, their worldview was not that Jesus was going to be the king. It was Rome. Their worldview was Rome. That this sovereign culture and empire of the day, everything that they had, that they did, was, had the, Romans government finger, the Roman government's fingerprints in it. They, their life was not untouched by the Roman government. It's moment where Jesus is being praised into the city, it says the whole city was stirred. And something's happened in our life where we get stirred. One side over here was questioning, who is this? They were stirred. And the other side is declaring and shouting. And so there's this disruption, there's this tension going on. And I think that that's kind of at the heart of what God wants to speak to us today is about disruptions that enter our life that can, can, can reveal potentially a faltering faith where disruptions come and it can sometimes reveal that our faith isn't as enduring as we thought it would be. See, an encounter with Jesus, especially the kind that leads to a profession of faith or the kind that alters the way that you live, has to involve, it has to involve a radical disruption of your life. Because without that, you know, we're living one way without Jesus, without him being the center of our life, without him being the way that we think and the way that we live. To get us on that path where he is the way that we live, we have to have something to shift us. And it's going to be some sort of disruption. It's going to be some sort of life-shifting moment. See, me and Kate were listening to a preacher a while back, and he made this shrewd observation about the C.S. Lewis, Lewis series, The Chronicles of Narnia. Who's, who's read all the books? Read all the books. That's impressive. I've only seen the first movie, so sorry. <laughs> um, I know that's a sin, but anyway. But he made this shrewd observation that each and every book, the story where they're kind of brought into Narnia, begins with a disruption that they probably weren't necessarily looking for, they weren't necessarily aware of, and it just happened. You know, I mean, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to appeal to the, the majority. If you've seen the movie, <laughs> they're, just, they're just playing a game. They're just trying to have fun and make the most of life. And all of a sudden, she's in Narnia, not even looking for it. And she's in Narnia. See, it's this type of disruption that alters the way that you've ever known life to now know life through the lens of redemption. That it's so important that we read this, this book cover to cover, this, this love letter from God, this, this, this wisdom that reveals things that we're not going to find anywhere else. Where it just, we read this book and we realize, life's more than I thought it was. 
there's these, it's not going to be like mythical creatures or anything, but there's this eternal being called God who has all power and eternal nature. And he breathed existence that he is meticulously involved in the world power that sends fire from heaven and I was reading this morning that that splits a sea that that's real I mean you're not going to see that in your everyday life apart from Jesus the reality that he brings to our lives Jesus wants to disrupt our lives so that we can truly understand what life is about it's not just about our job. It's not about just filling up our 401k. That would be a waste of what God says is a very meticulously, fearfully, and wonderfully made life. An encounter with Jesus, especially the kind that changes your life and the way that you live, has to involve a radical disruption. And a disruption will usually meet you where you're most focused, too. If somebody could look into the depths and thoughts of your life, they'd be able to tell what's most important to you, where you spend the most money, what you think the most about, how you make decisions, and on and on and on. They'd be, they would be able to know who you are and what's most important to you. What, then, what Jesus then does is he disrupts us where we're most likely to notice a disruption. That we're going to notice that, okay, where God wants to shift your life to now live every part of your life to the glory of God, he's going to meet you where it's most likely going to have an effect on you, where you're most focused, right? See, I, th I thought of Abraham, a few examples in the Bible. He was devoted to his work, him and, and his father before him. They were good at what they did, and they, they built a lot of wealth. And then Jesus comes in, God comes in, and he says, I want you to leave it. And I want you to go up, take your family, go into the desert, and I'll show you where to go. Leave it all. And it just spoke to me. It just pressed on my heart that when Jesus comes into our lives and says, follow us, it's not important that we know where we're going. It's important to know who we're following. Jesus, oh, Jesus, you want me to go with you? Okay, I'm going with you. And that's Peter. He was fishing. He was good at fishing. That's what him and his brother and his family, that's all they ever knew. And Jesus comes in and he says, there's so much more than just fishing for fish. I want you to fish for men. There's a deeper meaning to what you spend your life doing. Zacchaeus, his wealth. What happened when he encountered Jesus? He said, I'll give, I'll give it all back four times as much to the poor. Something happened when he encountered Jesus that his earthly possessions didn't actually mean that much to him anymore when he met Jesus. And Paul, Paul believed that he was on a mission to glorify God by getting rid of these radical Jesus followers. That's what he believed. He believed he was following God in that. And Jesus encounters him and flips the script. And now he's probably one of the most influential, he probably is the most influential, writing most of the New Testament most influential Christian in the world, in history. Because he encountered Jesus and he flipped his mission. For me, it was, it was my relationships. I wanted, I wanted to pursue acceptance. I wanted love. I wanted friendship. I wanted companionship. That's, that's what I pursued with my life. And then Jesus comes in and he says, I'm love. I'm acceptance. I accept you. I unconditionally love you. Having a relationship with me is what it's all about. And I don't know what that is for you. I don't know if you've had an encounter with Jesus like that where it just kind of shifted the way that you were going this way, but he just shifted your perspective a little bit so now you could see that that pursuit can be used by God is actually for God. Disruption will actually meet you where you're most focused. And God will disrupt us to turn us back to him in a life that truly matters. It's a merciful act of God to, to get us from going one way back to, what the life, back to the life that really matters. See, a disruption shakes us for a moment. It does. And it has to. It has to shake us for us to understand how unstable our life is apart from Jesus. Our life can't be built on anything else. 
It has to be built on Jesus for it to actually have the stability, sustenance, that's a word, that he made us for, to not be shaken. To not be shaken. Disruptions are going to keep coming back. Disruptions are going to keep coming in this life. This is a broken world. And disruptions exist all around us. How many of our lives were just so disrupted this past year? And probably many years before that. There's, it's not, it just doesn't just take a worldwide pandemic to shake you. Where you're most focused can sometimes be even more devastating when that's shaken. So when disruptions come again, what will your response be this time? As I read this passage, our Matthew 21 passage, and God was kind of speaking to me about what's your response to him. I kind of gleaned out three responses of people's encounter with Jesus in this in this moment here. And we're going to cover two today and, and the third one and a hidden one, secret one, next week. But two of them today. Now the disciples were here. They were part of the story, but they're more in the background. We're not going to get into their part of the story. But these two responses, and we've already kind of covered one. The people of the city were stirring. They said they were stirred when they encountered Jesus. They didn't know what was going on because these people, that this, Jesus wasn't their life wasn't what they thought life was about, and they were stirred. See, an un- unsustainable faith has, um, an unsustainable faith is prone to stirring when disruptions come. You'll be stirred if it's unsustainable. And what I want to kind of get into to, to really explain this a little bit more is the four underlying causes of stirring. Now, there are probably more they're probably less. I, I don't know. These are the four I felt God laid on my heart. Four underlying causes that could be what's making your faith, what's making our faith prone to being stirred. And the first one is this, a self-determination mindset. A self-determination mindset. This moment in Matthew 21 was a prophesied moment. It wasn't just, didn't just happen it was a prophesied moment. That perhaps that's, that's the way that God works. In advance, things don't just happen. See, this type of mindset, this self-determination mindset, it's very dangerous because it makes it all too easy to live without God. Because the self-determination mindset says that I determine my fate. I determine my future. I control my life. And some of us, we get it. We, we, don't, we know that this is not true. I, I'm not in control of my life. But sometimes we can just have this mindset that has yet to be changed. This mindset that just subconsciously thinks that I'm in control. And it's an underlying cause, meaning that sometimes we don't see it. We don't see that it's causing effect. It's cause and effect. We do have a responsibility. We do have a responsibility to steward our lives and live with wisdom and love, doing what Jesus tells us to do. But we have to understand the reality is this, that God is providentially involved in our lives. God is providentially involved in our lives. He's working in our lives deeper than we can really comprehend. That there's no way that I could possibly have the wisdom the power, the authority, and definitely not the omnipresence to manipulate the moving parts of my life to do exactly what I want to do. Now, I can plan ahead. I could try to get ahead. I can try to be organized. But the reality is, I can't predict anything. How can I control everything? Right? We get ourselves in this loop of just unnecessary anxiety. Because we think we're in control, but it's a, it's a subconscious uh, error in perspective. So I just, I, there's no way I could have predicted three months ago that I'd be here. Absolutely no way. God was over that. God did that. I didn't do that. Right? You didn't do that. 
There's no way to predict what God's going to do. And over these past few years, if you, I mean, yeah, if you would have told me in freshman year of college that I would be a lead pastor in a church in Michigan, <laughs> I'd be like, how'd you get there? <laughs> oh my goodness. But it's that. If I could try to manipulate and take control, I wouldn't end up where God would want me to be. You wouldn't end up where God would want you to be. We resist his good and perfect and loving will in that. And things have just happened over these past few years where it's just, it's almost completely eradicated my belief in coincidence. Where it's like, if that wouldn't have happened in my life, I don't know where I'd be. The friends that I've met, the moments that have happened that have just shifted, that God has meant me so deeply. So we're going to be stirred up, we're going to be disrupted, we're going to be disoriented, we're going to be confused, we're going to be bitter and resentful. When Jesus shows up, whether we see it or not, him showing up in our lives and disrupting things, and we realize that life's not in our hands, it's going to cause a lot of disruption. And we can save our disruption. As we already heard this morning that we can shout Hosanna, that God saves. God did it. Our king is coming to us. We can't bring him to us. We can't do what he can only do. I love what Jesus said to Pilate at Jesus' trial. It, just, it always sticks with me. He says, this is a paraphrase, but Pilate, you think you're in control. You think you're the one that has all the power to condemn me but you wouldn't have power unless I gave it to you. You wouldn't actually have the power unless you received it from above. So whether we know it or not, God is providentially involved in our lives. It's fascinating to me that how even when we think we're in control, the reality is it's God who allowed and willed for our lives to become what it is. You wouldn't have power to do the things that you're doing unless it was given to you from above. A self-determination mindset. A sense of opposition can be an underlying cause of disruption. Where there's these two sides. Who is this? This is Jesus. Who is this? This is Jesus. And there's people who think that this is what life's about. And there's other people saying, no, these, this, is who is life. this is who is life about. But yeah, we'll go with that. We feel disrupted when we meet opposition. Because it's a moment where we kind of feel attacked. That what we've always believed, that what we think is true, what we think life's about, there's somebody who has a, 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 a belief, a view, that's contrary to what we've always believed. And we feel attacked. There's this sense of opposition. People of the city asking, who is this? And they come face to face with these crowds that say that this is the king. But Herod's king. But Caesar's king. How, how can Jesus be king? It can be very disrupting and confusing. So there's this conflicting view of authority in this passage where this earthly person is king, but no, this, this person from heaven is king? Who's the king in your life? I'm talking like an earthly king. Who's the king in your life? Because if, if you're the king, if, if I'm the king of my life, and disruption comes, I question God's intentions. It's a false perspective that God's out to take away what I've been building my life to be. That God, you're out to take away what I've worked so hard for. That I have this plan, and you're disrupting it. You're taking it away. It's this false perspective that God is against us. But what is it? What do we read in Romans 8? That if God is for us, who can be against us? Right? That he goes on at the end of the chapter to say, there is nothing in all creation that could ever separate us from the love of God. And I read in the Psalms the other night, the psalmist said, the Lord is on my side. I will not fear. What can man do to me? If our lives are fully in Christ, we have this perspective that if God is for us, and he is, you have to understand that. Regardless of what we think in a moment, God is for us. If you follow him, if your life is in Christ, there is no such thing as opposition. There is no one against you. God is for you. 
What can the world do to you? What can the world do to me? They can kill me. Okay, I'm just going to go to heaven. I'm going to be with Jesus. Is that the worst thing you can do to me? What can man do to me? There is no opposition when our lives are fully in Christ. And what I'm doing here is we're, we're addressing the underlying causes of stirring and how we can eradicate, we can flip that cause to say that, no, that's not true. That's not true. I don't have opposition. God's not against me. That's for me. And now I can live knowing that he is, he's working all things to the glory of his will. A weak obedience. And for this one, this, this third underlying cause, I want us to turn to Luke chapter 6, if you will. It'll be on the screen, so you don't have to if you don't want to. Um, Luke chapter 6. This is kind of Luke's account, recounting of Jesus' Sermon on the Mount. And so this one will sound familiar. Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not do what I tell you? Everyone who comes to me and hears my words and does them, I will show you what he is like. He is like a man building a house who dug deep and laid the foundation on the rock. When the flood arose and the stream broke against that house and could not shake it because it had been well built. But the one who hears and does not do them is like a man who built a house on the ground without a foundation. He didn't dig deep. He didn't lay it on the rock. When the stream broke against that house, immediately it fell, and the fall, the ruin of that house was great. There's a word used in that passage that's also used in our Matthew 21 passage, and that's the word immediately. Before we understand this word immediately, we have to understand that God doesn't work at our pace. We receive at his. That, that as we ask, as we say, Lord, Lord, do this, he doesn't work at our pace. What God wants to do, he says, listen to my words. What God wants to do, we receive at his pace. He doesn't work at ours. See, with God's will, like this is a prophecy, this is, this is a prophesied moment, God ordained. With God's will to do as he pleases, his good, and perfect, and pleasing will, and our responsibility, you're going to go, I'm going to give you this responsibility to go and get this donkey for me. With that in tandem, our lives will either immediately begin working towards the trajectory of eternal life or immediately become subject to the fall and ruin of sin. It's, a, it's an immediate thing. Where our lives could, could start to become towards God's will or they could start to become towards this fall and ruin of sin. See, shouting Lord, Lord doesn't just give us a, a, a free pass or a, a magic token special spell to a perfect life, a blessed life, for God to do what we want him to do. This, it's not about what we want. It's about what God wants, listening to him and obeying him. And I'll show you why this is kind of an underlying cause of stirring. I, I, I kind of thought of these three earthly perspectives of authority. So you've got a king, a police officer, and a principal. Sounds like the beginning of a bad joke. But I see where you guys are at. But so these earthly figures of authority, right? They retain those titles because that's who they are. Jesus is Lord. Yes, you're calling me Lord, Lord. That's who I am. But if these, these earthly authorities, if I don't do what they tell me to, things are not going to work out for me too well. Right? They're still a police officer. They're still a king. They're still a principal. But if I don't do what they say, it's not going to go down for me very well. How much more before the king of kings, the Lord of lords, the God of all creation, to whom all authority in heaven on earth has been given, if I don't do what he says, right? Not for the person who builds their life on the solid foundation of Jesus, of his word who does what he says, abides and lives with him daily. When those disruptions and those storms come, it says that when the floods arose and the stream broke against the, house, against the house, they could not be shaken because it had been built well built. So when the disruptions of life come, come against you, you cannot be shaken if you're built upon Jesus, right? But if we're not, if we're not doing what he says, 
of course we're going to get shaken. A weak obedience is an underlying cause of being shaken. And the fourth one is this, an attitude of discontentment. This one's going to shake you in more ways than none, and it, I think it gets to me the most, honestly. So, quick story. So, Kate and I recently received a gift. It's a really nice gift. I've been really wanting one for a long time. Does anybody know what a Chemex coffee maker is? Nobody. <laughs> yes, okay, we got one. Okay, we got one. Okay. Yeah, my parents do, because I showed it to them. <laughs> so, it's just a different way to make coffee, and from what I believe and what others have told me, it's the best way to make coffee. So I'll have to make some for you sometime. So. Um, but here's, here's what happened. So yesterday morning, um, me and Kate were going to go to a wedding in the afternoon. So we decided to just have breakfast together, read our Bibles together, you know, just spend the morning together. She was making breakfast. I was making the coffee with my new Chemex coffee maker. <laughs> so I load every, everything up in this bag and I bring everything. I mean, we, you have to have different things. You have to have the Chemex, which is this like hourglass coffee maker deal. It's, it's glass and everything. You have to have the filters. You, I mean, if you really want to get into it, you need a scale to measure out your coffee. And you need some nice coffee, so you need a grinder to grind your beans. I mean, it's just, I think, this was all a gift, so <laughs> I'm very thankful. So I pack up all that stuff, right? I get to her house, and I'm all excited for my Chemex coffee. And I, I'm coming up to the counter, and I, I'm unpacking. I got the grinder. I got the coffee maker. I got the, the scale. I got my kettle. I needed a kettle, too. I got the kettle. I got, I got the filters. I left the coffee at home. <laughs> Kate will tell you, I, I about broke down in tears. Because <laughs> it was just... Oh my goodness, that's so frustrating. I, mean, I live five minutes down the road. It's not a big deal. <laughs> but it was a big deal to me at the time, right? So we go back. She's like, it's fine, it's fine. Let's just go back, get the coffee, come back. So we do. So I get the coffee, I measure it out, and you know, get in my, I'm, I'm in my zone. And I go to put it in the coffee grinder and push start. <laughs> and the coffee grinder doesn't work. <laughs> How am I supposed to have good coffee if I can't grind my coffee? <sighs> I was very dissatisfied with that moment. I had, you know, I wasn't too upset. I was more excited than upset. Because <laughs> I knew I was eventually going to get my coffee. I just didn't. All right. But I was so dissatisfied with the circumstances of that moment, right? That's what discontentment is. Dissatisfied with the circumstances of life. And this not only disrupts our lives in that a discontented person is never happy with the circumstances of their life or a certain part of their life. But you add on top of that the changing climate and conditions of life all around us. And then you add on top of that the ever coming disruptions and storms. It's just a disaster, right? If I couldn't be happy before, how about when everything's changing and bad things keep happening to me? I can never be happy. I can never be content. Right? Hebrews 12, the author of Hebrews 12, he, he talks about this time when God's going to shake the earth and everything that can be shaken will be shaken. Everything that won't last is prone to being shaken and it will be shaken and it will be no more. And then he says this, therefore, since that's about to happen, let us be grateful for receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken. Let us be grateful. See, discontentment, or on the flip side, contentment is caused by being grateful that I've already received a kingdom, right? See, when God shakes the earth and the only thing that remains is his kingdom, eternal life, are you in that kingdom? Are you content? Are you, is the kingdom enough for you, even here and now. If you've ever heard the phrase, everlasting life with Jesus starts now and lasts forever, right? You've received a kingdom. What more could you possibly want than a kingdom? I have a kingdom, Jesus. You've given me a kingdom. 
I don't need anything else. Are you content to live within a spiritual kingdom of abundance, everlasting abundance? Or are you going to be prone to being shaken in a world designed to steal your joy? Jesus tells us, do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moths and rust can come in and destroy and thieves will break in and steal, where things can be lost and will be lost eventually. But store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where moth and rust do not destroy and thieves cannot break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. And here's the deal. We, we can't take our earthly treasures that Jesus says, do not store up for your treasures on earth. We can't take our earthly treasures and transfer them over to heaven, right? I, I, I want this to last forever, so I'm going to transfer this over to the heavenly bank account, right? So I can keep it, save it for later, right? It'll be safe there. No, they're two separate realities. Two separate realities. Everything on earth, everything in our earthly lives, all of our earthly treasures will be destroyed, will leave eventually. How many of us can say that? That it didn't last. I hoped in it so much and it didn't last. And what we sell for ourselves treasures in heaven, that's where our heart is, that's where our treasures are. How can we be dis- discontent? Discontentment is not a possessions problem. It's a perspective problem. Right? It's, it's this perspective that says, where are my treasures? Are my treasures on earth? My treasures in heaven? Are my, are my, is my treasure in the things that won't last or in the things that will last? And it's hard because we can't see necessarily our heavenly treasures. That's why discontentment is a possessions problem. And contentment is a perspective being shifted, right? So those are four underlying causes of stirring. That these things in our life, uh, uh, and a mindset of self-determination, a weak obedience, a sense of opposition, an attitude of discontentment, and there might be more, maybe God is laying those on your heart, that are going to make our faith prone to being unsustainable, not able to endure the disruptions of life. So on the flip side, what would it look like if those were not hindering my faith? If those were not hindering my faith and I could have faith in Jesus that's going to endure the disruptions, the ever-coming disruptions of life? In response number two. Response number one was the people of the city. Response number two I'm calling the obedient donkey owners. Sounds weird, but that's how I'm going to... I don't have their names, so. The obedient donkey owners. And this is a transformed perspective response. Say, I'm not going to be stirred, but I have a transformed perspective to not have a sustainable faith. So, what makes these obedient donkey owners people who are not hindered in their faith? And we don't know much about them. This is the only place that they're mentioned. So I'm going to have to make a bold assumption without trying to breathe heresy. I think it's okay, all right? I'm not going to make any rash assumptions. But, again, we don't know much about these people. They own this donkey and colt. They could have been farmers. They were from a small village. Jesus sent them into a village. They probably didn't have much. I mean, they weren't living up in the, the high-rises of the upper city, right? So they probably didn't have much. And so the two disciples, as they were untying the donkey, the possession of these probably not wealthy donkey owners or farmers or villagers. As they were untying them and upon being questioned, explaining that the Lord needs them, there was no offense at what could have been seen as opposition, no clinging to their possessions showing discontentment, no hesitation, but quick obedience. It says, Jesus says, if, if, if you're asked, somebody stops you and says, what are you doing with my donkeys? <laughs> Just say to them, the Lord needs them, and he will send them at once. And, and I think Mark, Luke, and John, they, they all explain the interaction going on between the disciples and the donkey owners. But Matthew doesn't. He just says, the disciples brought the donkey and the colt and put them on their cloaks, put on them their cloaks. He's just like, Matthew's, I mean, it, it, they did what Jesus said. They gave him, you know, let's just get to the point. 
They didn't hesitate. They gave him. They gave their possession. When they heard that the Lord needed it of them, the Lord needs them, the true king, the Lord of the universe, who ultimately owns and governs all things, there was no doubt in their mind and no stirring except to do immediately what Jesus asked of them. And this is why I'm making this bold assumption that there was nothing hindering, no underlying cause of stirring to disrupt in this disruption moment because I think they might have already had an encounter with Jesus. Not, maybe not Jesus per se, but encounter with God that shifted their perspective. They say, I don't, the Lord needs this of me. He's never done anything but good for my life. I understand that God is, he, he owns this ultimately. Whatever he wants to do, yes, he can do it in my life. Do we, do we have that perspective that wouldn't hesitate when Jesus says, I need this? I don't know if they were in the middle of a prophecy, if they knew they were in the middle of a prophecy. I don't know if they knew that. But when you realize the opportunity to be a part of something greater than what at first looks like loss or sacrifice, you're going to take this from me? How can we live from, with this perspective? The Lord needs them. What does the Lord need of those he encounters so he can display himself with king, as king with it? Right? What did he use those donkeys for? To ride into the city, to fulfill this prophecy that the king would be on that donkey, on that colt. He displayed himself as king with it. And there's this transformed perspective that led to these donkey owners, I'm calling them, to be a part of this moment. Romans 12 is where I went upon thinking about this. It'll be on the screen. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good, pleasing, and perfect. Another honorable mention is, is verse 36 of the previous chapter. For from him and through him and to him are all things. That's a perspective to have when it comes to our, our earthly view of life. From whom are things? Him. Where did I receive this? From him. How am I going to live? Through him. Who am I going to live for? To him. To him be the glory forever. Amen. And what Paul is saying is that this is how you can begin to have this perspective that thinks like God does, that you may be able to discern what is the will of God. Give your body as a living sacrifice. Give it to him. All that you have and all that you are, give it to him. Don't be conformed to the way that this world thinks and lives and does life. No, don't do that. Be transformed and then renewal of your mind. Allow your mind, allow your perspective to be transformed. That by testing, and this word is used for testing the genuineness of precious metals. That by testing, you may prove to have a genuine faith that is able to discern what God's will is. Right? That I could know what God's will is. In, in the previous chapter, it says, the depths and riches and wisdom and knowledge of God, how unsearchable are his judgments and how inscrutable his ways. For who has known the mind of the Lord and who has been his counselor and who has given him a gift that he might be repaid? The way that God works, the way that God thinks, it's so beyond what I can know. And you're telling me I can discern what God's will is if I give him my life? Right? If I get my mind transformed, to know that God isn't trying to mess up our plans. God isn't trying to mess up my plans. He wants us to be a part of a greater story. That's his ways. He wants to be a part of a greater story by first getting our plans out of the way. Your plans aren't my plans. Isaiah says, your thoughts are not my thoughts. Your ways are not my ways. As high as the heavens are above the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways and my thoughts than your thoughts. That's what God says. 
What if these guys had already experienced these donkey owners? I got a good different name for them because that sounds weird. <laughs> what if these guys had already had an experience with Jesus, a disruption that transformed their minds to now see the implications of God as king and that serving him as such opens the door to be a part of his heavenly kingdom, to be part of a greater life, a life of everlasting purpose and meaning, living for much more than what we just can see, that, that God's trying to open the door to Narnia so we could glimpse a greater reality of what life's about. Here's the big idea for the message. To have a genuine, sustaining faith, one's perspective has to be transformed. To have a genuine, sustaining faith, something that will last and not be prone to stirring when disruptions come, one's perspective, a perspective that sees that from him and through him and to him are all things. He is for me, not against me. He's on my side. No one can be against me. It's this perspective change that will lead to a genuine, sustaining, and I would say all satisfying faith. God, with his allowing of disruptions into our lives, is mercifully trying to direct us and protect us so that our lives are increasingly going the direction of eternal life. He wants, us to, he wants the best for us. He's our father. He's a good and loving God. And he wants us to go this way. Sometimes we need disruptions so we don't head back the other way. While it remains true that God, God is, is that, he's in control. He wants good things. It's our mind's perspective preceded by our entrusting our lives to him, living sacrifice, which will determine our response in the midst of disruptions. Either we'll see it, either we'll get it, either we'll understand what God's trying to do, and we'll respond in faith and in obedience and worship, or we'll miss the chance to be a part of a greater and deeper work. If you have this perspective, this sees that God is trying to use you to tr push your life, toward, to create your life towards a greater and deeper purpose, you've got to have that perspective. We can respond in faith or miss the chance be a part of it. What if all those that God encountered, Paul, Peter, Achaeus, um, what was the other one, Abraham, and countless others, what if they said no, right? <laughs> Drop your nets, follow me. No. <laughs> Who is Peter? I will build my church upon this rock, Petros, Peter, the guy who started the church. What if he said no to Jesus? What a missed out opportunity. Like I said at the beginning of the message, we are God's workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works. That's the purpose of our lives. Our life was made for so much greater than anything we could accomplish or think of for ourselves. I could brainstorm just whatever I could be it's not as great as if God makes us into who he created us to be. Our life's greatest potential is in the hands of God. And God doesn't work at our pace. We receive at his. Our greatest potential is realized when God is most glorified. Right. So let's recap. Disruptions. An encounter with Jesus that alters the way you live has to involve radical disruption in your life. You have to be shifted in the way you live and think. A disruption usually meets where you're most focused so God can get your attention in that moment and say, okay, we're going back. We're going back this other way. And that leads to God will disrupt us to turn us back to him in a life that truly matters. And there are these underlying causes of stirring. You know, a, a self-determination mindset, a sense of opposition, a weak obedience, or um, an attitude of discontentment. And there could be others. But it's this cause of stirring that if it was flipped, we would see that God is providentially involved in our lives. If our lives are fully in Christ, there is no opposition. A life's person, a life, a person's life, a life's person, is well built on the foundation of the world, word. A person's life that is well built, I, I wrote that wrong, that is well built on the foundation of the word cannot be shaken. If you're built on Jesus, you can't be shaken. And discontentment is not a possessions problem, it's a perspective problem. And to have a genuine, the big idea, to have a genuine, sustaining faith, 
Your perspective, the way you see and think of life, has to be transformed. And our mind's perspective, preceded by entrusting our lives to him, will determine our response in the midst of disruption. Either we'll see it or we'll miss it. So what I want to do is, if you have a note sheet, you'll see at the bottom a next steps thing. If you don't, it'll be on the screen. What I want us to do is just take a minute and think about these questions. Where have disruptions entered your life, right? And what might God be revealing to you about your faith because of your mind's perspective in those disruptions? And what, have, what is God asking of you so he can be glorified with it, so he can display himself as king of the universe with it? You know, this could involve a few things, things that God might be asking of you if you need some ideas. It usually involves our time, our talents, or our treasures. And you could throw ideas in there, right? These donkey and colt, this guy's possession, his treasures. God needs this of me. Of course I'm going to give it to him. For us, it, I thought of this. In this day and age, it's probably going to be our time. Not so much our money. We'd be willing to give our money before we gave our time, right? Time is money. It takes... It takes a, a big willingness to give our time sometimes. Sometimes, yeah. So, take a minute. Think about these questions. I want us to really press into this. Jesus, if you need something of us, then have it. There's no, no greater worth than a life found in Christ. God, if there's anything keeping us from having an unhindered faith, God, reveal that to us and make us stronger. Grow us, Lord disrupt us, allow it to come, and allow us to have a perspective in the midst of the disruptions that sees that God is trying to take me into his life. Turn me back to him and give me a life of everlasting worth and meaning and satisfaction. Jesus, we thank you for the word of God. Lord, press on our hearts continually, daily, how we can serve you with our time, with our talents, with our treasures, with our ideas, that you may be glorified, that we don't do as we do, we do as the Father tells us to, as you did, Jesus. God, thank you for allowing me to be your mouthpiece. Thank you for this place where we can gather and hear the truth and know the truth, worship in spirit and in truth. And God, with people who come in here, people who watch online, Sense this spirit about what we're doing here, Lord. So we go out praying that your spirit walks with us, that the places we go and the people we talk to are touched by everlasting power through our love, through our words and our deeds. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, I hope you have a wonderful week. Again, it's good to be your pastor. And I hope we can, as many as us if we can, if it takes two years, I want to sit down with you people. I want to know your story. I want you to know mine. Um, and I want us to walk together as we journey to 
represent Jesus, speak his truth, tell of his gospel, and save lives. Right? All right. Have a good week.